chapter 3 as we continue on with this great epistle written by the, the Apostle Peter. What a, great, what a great message it is for us today. Carrie, you shaved your beard. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's good to see the rest of your face, man. <laughs> Unless my eyes are betraying me. Okay. I, good stuff. <laughs> uh, don't have the results yet on the biopsy. I oh, should know that sometime this week, but just trusting the Lord. God's good. Feel, feeling better and better. Uh, it's just too way too slow, you know. <laughs> just want this to be over and done and get on with it. But we'll keep trusting the Lord. So thanks, thanks for your prayers. Uh, let's pray and ask God's blessing upon His word this morning. Thanks, Father, for Your word that is life and breath and strength and nourishment to us. Uh, it is so good uh, to think and meditate upon the word and to hear the truth that speaks into our lives so powerfully that impacts us and, and changes us that we might be more and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we thank you for your grace to us today and ask your blessing as we share together in this, your word, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Uh, let's do this, let's stand with you, would you please, one more time as we just read this passage of scripture together from uh, actually, just to begin in first eight, uh, follow along as I read chapter 3, verse 8 through verse 12. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Now, this passage is such an important passage to us because it's very practical in the things that Peter is saying to us. And I'm just grateful for that. Uh, this whole third chapter is uh, a, a good, uh, well, these are commandments. They are not suggestions. And if we follow what God says in his word, then it's amazing what it, how it impacts our lives. And so in our last session together, in our last lesson, uh, we, we, we looked at this question. Uh, how do we know if we're mature or not? This talk, we're talking about Christian maturity and how do we know whether we're mature or not? Or whether we are uh, chronologically old but not very old, uh, spiritually speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to think of it in times of, you know, that, uh, at times of, I've been in the way for a long time, only in the way doesn't mean that I've been a Christian for a long time, it just means I've been in the way. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I've found that I've been in that situation. But how do we know? Uh, how do we know that our growth spiritually is, is progressing? It's a lifelong, first of all, it's a lifelong process. We never, any one of us, get there so that we can say, I've arrived, just not there. And, then, and in this section of 1 Peter, we are given certain, uh, I, I don't know exactly what to call them, maybe measuring sticks, to give us an idea. We've talked about that from uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 8 last Sunday, about these various things that we are to do, and those are measuring sticks that we can say, well, I have grown in that, we know that we have. And so today we're going to continue the, three, the theme of, of Christian maturity uh, by examining two more points from verses uh, 9 uh, through 12. We talked about uh, our, our conversion, but now we're going to talk about we are sanctified uh, in our, our conversation, that we are to be sanctified in our conversation and saintly in our character and how that is is taking place. So let's talk first about uh, uh, about being submissive in our conversation, not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, 
that you may inherit a blessing. Well, there's first of all really a demanding obligation, as I said, said it's, these are not suggestions. We are not to do this. We are commanded not to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. And so it's a, it, uh, he, he's really talking here about retaliation. We are not to retaliate, not returning evil for evil. And we, we can talk about it in terms of our natural response, for example. Uh, now, I would love to believe that Peter is talking primarily about uh, of how we are to respond to those who are outside of the faith. But he really is talking about this internal relationship that we have in the church in terms of our response to one another. And we are not as brothers and sisters in the Lord to return reviling for reviling or evil for evil. How many of you understand that sometimes we can get a little... Uh, ungodly in our responses to each other, right? And so we are to take this to heart, how we are to speak to one another, how we are to interact with one another. And it's just so important. I am altogether sure uh, he isn't in, that he is not including those of us who know the Lord as well. So it, it's, it's speaking to us because who's he writing this to? The people who have been dispersed, the dysphoria, those who have been scattered abroad because of the persecution. So he's talking to us about how we are to treat one another in our in our conversation. Uh, James has a lot to say about that. We read in our scripture reading today what he had to say about the tongue and what an evil thing the tongue can be and how we need to learn to control our tongues. Can I get a good amen for that? Amen. That's pretty good. So uh, our, our obligation is to be that. We, we can respond carnally to one another, but he's calling us to give a Christian response. But on the contrary, he says, that, that reviling and all of those things, that's the carnal, but he's talking about a Christian response. On the contrary, he says, we are to bless one another. I, you know, I, I've been... I've been tempted at times to pray for God to bless somebody with a brick, you know, uh, because of the things. That's a good Christian response, isn't it? Lord, bless them with a brick. No, but refusing, refusing to extract revenge or responding in kind to criticism is one thing. But blessing them, that's sometimes a different thing. Uh, I have a little poem that I, I don't know where I heard this, but I heard this long ago, but I think it just is a great poem. To live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> and so sometimes we find ourselves in that position. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, account, I think, of, of a response in the Old Testament that I think is just terrific. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And it's, and it's about uh, this little uh, Jewish gal that has taken captive. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn there with me to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, or he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, look at that situation. She's taken captive as the armies are there and fighting. And so she is in a hostile land, in a hostile environment, waiting on the wife of a man who is a leper in that kind of situation. It's a little Jewish girl. And she, she could have, in that situation, responded by saying, the creep deserves it. I hope he dies from that. And it may be a slow and painful death. You know, that's the way she could have responded. However, she didn't do that. And so how important it is, as we sat, see that example, that's just one of many, many examples that we can look at throughout the scriptures of how people responded, both on the positive and negative side. But the greatest thing that we are to look to is Christ as our example. Remember that one word that he started chapter 3 with? 
likewise, or in the same way, in the same manner. So Christ as our example, as we see in the latter part of chapter two, as, as that's the pattern that we look to. And so here we see this example of that. And we've just been give, given that example in the previous chapter. So there is not to be a retaliation. And, and here is the realization about that. For the last part of verse nine, knowing that you were called to this, knowing that's our calling. We are to live that way in this present world. How many of you understand sometimes that's tough? Yeah, it isn't always easy, but we're called to that. That is our calling to be those kind of people in the world that we are in. We must always, always be reminded of our calling as Christians because that's going to help us love our enemies. We talked about in, in that in class today, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many of you know and understand, I don't have any trouble loving myself. And neither do you, by the way. We all love ourselves. Paul says in Ephesians, no man yet has ever hated his own self. We all love and cherish and take care of ourselves. So, you know, our problem is not uh, a bad self-image. As much as sometimes, as much as sometimes people like to believe that, you don't have a self-image. If you didn't have a bad self-image, or if you had a bad self-image, you wouldn't get up in the morning and comb your hair and brush your teeth and make yourself presentable for other people. You wouldn't do that. Why do we do that? Because we love ourselves. That's our problem. But what do we do? We understand the purpose of, of what God is doing in our lives, reminding ourselves as our calling as Christians, we are to be kind and loving and live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. If our thinking is that we've been saved to be happy and blissfully go on our way, we've missed the whole point of the thing. Uh, there is so much more than that, and it, and it harkens it back again to Jesus as our example. As he was in the world, so are we to be in the world. That's our calling, to be kind, to be loving. Our neighbor, that may be a Christian neighbor, and it may not be a Christian neighbor be that guy that I have, this horrible neighbor, but that we're called to love. So we are, as I've stated on uh, numerous occasions, we are the visible representation of Jesus Christ on the planet. We are to be like Christ in it. So it's, a, it's, just, it's just critical that we understand that and embrace it because sometimes we lose sight of that. We think about all kinds of, we get caught up with the job, or whatever it may be, and we forget. What are we called to be? Called to be Christ-like in the way that we live, in our conversation. So it's just so important. Well, here's another fact about that. Not only, not only the retaliation thing and the realization of what we're called to be, but to understand that there's a reward for doing that. Here's what it says, that you may inherit a blessing. Wow. There is something that goes along with it. Now, from just, from just um, thinking of it purely from an earthly standpoint, there is blessing in loving other people and being kind and so forth in our conversation, being that that is pleasing to the Lord. There is that blessing that comes with that because it makes the relationships that we have that much better. People, people respond better to that kind of a person than they do to the person who's always complaining and grumbling and griping about everything that's going on. It's easy for us to fall into that. You know, this crazy government that we live, rah, 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 you know, go on and all on and on. But what about the blessings that we have received and to be speaking words of encouragement and kindness and uh, praying for those who uh, even despitefully use us? That's what we're called to. It's what we are to do, that we, we inherit a blessing, that you may inherit a blessing. The persecutions that we experience today and add, uh, add up, as we respond right to a reward that we would receive. We also inherit a blessing today when we treat even our enemies, even our enemies with love and mercy. When we don't respond in kind or when we don't join in the griping and the complaining. When we respond with Christ likeness when reviled or when we hear those kinds of things taking place, when we respond with blessing and not cursing, we are blessed in doing that. It may not be that all of a sudden God pours out a bucket of blessing on our lives. It may be understanding that there is reward coming at the end of life when we go to be with the Lord to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That is a huge blessing. 
when we respond with Christ-likeness. Uh, is that kind of response demanding? What does it take to respond like that? Well, it takes an awareness, a realization of our calling. But that is where our new nature is to rule over the, the natural inclination of our heart and mind. Any, you know, somebody said something like, you know, any fish, any old fish can float downstream. It takes a real live one to go upstream. And so when we go against the flow, when the natural inclination of our heart and our nature is to be negative and all of those sorts of uh, emotional responses, when we respond in a Christ-like manner, we become a blessing to the people that are around us. Hard? Sometimes it's really difficult. But we are to respond in that way. So a demanding obligation, but that also speaks to us in terms of a desirable objective. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Wow. What a tough call that is. Uh, here, Peter is quoting from the 34th Psalm, and that is a tremendous passage of Scripture, verses 12 and 13. And it's in the context of being submissive in our conversation, submitting to the Lord about the words that come out of our mouth. It's in that context that he's speaking, and it's a call to be firmly grounded in controlling our tongues. Amen. And it comes on the heels of the warning against lashing out in vengeance in verse number nine. So that contrasting response. So the thought is that our words are to be uh, more uh, likely to get in the way from if we respond out of our feeling, out of our natural selves. But the mature believer, Peter is telling us, what does he do? Or, and even the psalmist is saying, we are to tame our tongue Avoiding things like gossip or slander or crude language, deceptions, exaggeration, and all kinds of wickedness and folly. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you this so we can pray about it together. <laughs> oh, we are so self-deceived at times, are we not? not to participate in that crude language or deception. Truth intended to deceive is a lie. That's deception. It's like, I think I've told you this before, the, the, the first mate wrote in his log every day about the captain. The captain was sober again today. Well, what did that impression leave? Well, he was sober every other day, but that suggested that there were days when he wasn't. Truth intended to deceive is a lie. So we have to be careful about those kinds of things, even in exaggeration, which we are prone to do. Uh, that thing is a million miles away from me. Well, really? I mean, it's, we just, you know, all kinds of stuff that we just need to guard our, our, our mouths with, all kinds of uh, folly things. But it's interesting to me that he's quoting this particular song in the context of what he's talking about here. David wrote this psalm after he had sought asylum in Gath when he was fleeing from Saul. You recall the story. It's one of David pretending to be insane when he realized that he was, he was there with Goliath's sword among his kin, Goliath's kin. And so he feigned madness in order to escape. Remember, he's scratching at the walls and slobbering down his beard and carrying on like that. And Abimelech says, you know, Am I short of madmen in my kingdom that we have this guy here right in front of my eyes? Get him out of here. But David did all of that. Why, why would this psalm uh, be quoting this Peter in this context? Because what David had done uh, uh, was uh, he lied to Abimelech about his mission. He told him he was on an urgent mission for Saul so much so that he, he didn't even have time to get his sword. The result of all of that was that there was this guy there Doeg by name, who observed all that was taking place, and he ratted on David and told him, told Saul about what was going on. And the result of that was 85 people were put to death by Saul because of David's lie. So he's telling us about that. 
that we are not to get involved in that. So it is an obligation that we have. And the second half of the verse tells us it's a difficult proposition. The word that Peter and David chose are important there. He says evil for evil. Uh, uh, refrain from that. It's a word which signifies our natural depravity, our disposition to do wrong. We are to refrain from evil by choice. Now, no man, James tells us, is tempted uh, by God. He's tempted when he, by his own desires, he is drawn away and enticed. And then what happens? Sin and sin produces death. And so that process is going on, but we are to refrain from that. See, this is just so important. How do we do that? How do we know, how do we distinguish what is evil when there are so many things that are options in front of us and all that? I, you know, you're gonna hear me say this many times. Yes, amen. This is how you know. This is how you know. Because we are in the word, we are hearing what the spirit of God is saying to us. We're meditating on the word of God. Blessed is the man who walks not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. That's Psalm 1. How do we know? Because we can understand from Scripture, and the Spirit of God directs us and gives us the direction that we need. So that's just so important, so that we understand. Or, or the passage that we read last week from Hebrews, uh, we are... By this time, the writer says you ought to be teachers, but you need to go back to the basic principles. You need milk and not solid food you, so that you can discern, know what is good, what is not good. That's so important, and that's the knowledge that we have. The word for deceit here is also translated guile and refers to a, a bait or snare. We are to refrain from those kinds of things. The word refrain comes from a word that means to stop. So what is Peter telling us? Essentially, he's just saying, cut it out. Don't be like that. That's not what we're called to. What is the warning then from David and Peter? If you want to experience an, a life that is filled with good days, what are we to do? Speak truthfully and refrain from speaking things that are not true. Half-truths. A half-truth is still a lie, isn't it? So it's just so important. So David experienced the consequences of his deceit firsthand. He could speak from his own experience the necessity of being truthful in what is going on. Simply put, we just need to be truthful in our conversation all the time. Then, you know, if you always tell the truth, you don't ever have to worry about whatever lie you may have told in the past. You just tell the truth, it just simplifies stuff, doesn't it? I know none of you would do that, but it's still, if you uh, ever come across a time where you're put in that position, you know what to do. What should you do? Tell the truth. Amen? Yeah, that's good. Be truthful. It's, it's a good, it, actually, you know, it's a good prayer that we can pray at the beginning, of the, uh, the beginning of every day. Lord, help me to walk in the truth, to be truthful in everything that goes on today. Because there are temptations where, I mean, don't you experience that? Where sometimes there's, there's an option before you. If you tell the truth, man, it could get you in trouble. So if you just shade it a little bit, you would slip out of that deal. Be truthful. Be Christ-like. It's not only about our tongues, it's also about our character. We need to be saintly in our character. Uh, again, that's, that's something that uh, I guess I would say we, are struck, we struggle to, to call ourselves saints, right? How many saints here this morning? Well, there's several of you that are. Uh, some, of you, some of you are not sure. It's, we are saints by virtue of the fact that we have come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Look at Paul's epistles. To the saints. saints. We see that all the way through the epistles. We're called saints. It just means set apart ones. How have we been set apart? We have come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now I also know that sometimes I am prone to not act very saintly. Anybody join with me in that mission? Okay. Some of you still haven't realized all of that. That's okay. It's good enough. But look, look what he says. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So here, here's the right path. 
This is the way. If we would love life and see good days, here's what we are supposed to do. Remember, talk about what God's word tells us in terms of how we're to live. So here's what we're doing. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Two things. One, there is purity that is being called for here. A life of purity. He's continuing here in, to quote uh, Psalm 34. He's talking about a life that turns away from evil inclinations, temptations, and even sins that are so easily, as the Hebrew writer says, that so easily beset us. We are to turn away from those things. We have a choice. It's kind of like standing in the freeway. You've got a choice. You either stand there and get run over by the truck or you get over to the curb, right? It's a choice. So we don't put ourselves, we are not to put ourselves in the path of that. Dummy, get off the road. They make sidewalks for that. So we, but you know, I just love dodging cars in the freeway. It is so exciting. What will it do? James tells us it leads to death. So we need to flee those kinds. If we would love life, see good days, turn away from evil. Don't put yourself in the position. If you know something is there in that thing, in that situation, don't go there hoping, well, maybe something will happen. No, just don't go there. Stay away from it. I think about that in just all kinds of situations, like that, you know, in the computer, the things that you can find there. If, if there's a temptation there, don't go there. Just don't go there. Amen? Amen. It's, about it's about continuing to avoid something because we despise and loathe it. See, here's the problem. If we didn't love our sin, we wouldn't do it. Mm. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy what? The pleasures of sin for a season. And so here's the thing. We have to loathe those things. Why? Because we know that those are displeasing. They are things that God has not called us to. He's called us to purity in the way that we are supposed to live. We're not trying to not sin. We're rather, we're trying to live godly lives. If I live life just trying to dodge the trucks and the cars on the freeway, there's no joy in that. But if I choose not to go there, then I enjoy the, the blessing and the presence of God in our lives. So, be, why is that? Well, it's because we understand the truth about what the Word of God says. Armed with that understanding, we have purpose in life that goes beyond, far beyond just the mundane, the mundane kinds of stuff. We're to live a life of purity, but we're also to live a life of peace. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Tall order. We love, we love ourselves and what we're doing in the sense that we seek to preserve our dignity, to stand up for our rights. I've got a right and I'll stand up for that, but that's not what we're called to do. Whether it's over a minor doctrinal issue or whether it's uh, the tooth, well, which end you to choose to squeeze the toothpaste from. You know, some are in the middle, some are at the end. It, what Does it matter? Are we gonna argue over that? But we do those kinds of things and too often we have the, compa the capacity to rob ourselves and others of peace. Too often, instead of seeking peace and pursuing peace, more often we, we pursue controversy and we engage in sometimes even an open conflict. Over what? Stuff that's not worthy of us. Really, it shouldn't, shouldn't those things uh, that we, who, uh, we claim to be following the Prince of Peace, shouldn't we be seeking those things rather than those other kinds of things? It takes work to live at peace. Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says that we are to be at, live at peace with all men as much as in us live at peace. You know one of the problems with that? There are some people that don't want to live at peace. What do you do when you meet those people? You try with all your heart to live peaceably. The entirety of the psalm is very beneficial for us because it lets us know that every day is not going to be problem free. We anticipate that. That's not that we're always looking for trouble. It's just living in this world with the understanding of what's taking place and how we're to live in terms of how that's we confront that. He describes broken hearts, problems, afflictions, to name a few. But a good day for us, for us is not one in which we are pampered and sheltered, but one in which we experience God's help and God's blessing because of or in spite of the trials and the trial, the temptations that we go through. We have to have the right perspective in this. 
For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. There's a contrast, there's a difference between those who are righteous and those who are wicked. It carries the idea of being watchful in everything. David certainly had his lapses, but he also had laid hold of a wonderful truth, and God knows what's going on in our lives. Think of Jesus' words in Matthew about the sparrow. What does he say? Not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from my father's will. Think of that. If that's true of the sparrow, uh, the one that made a home in my grill as I was traveling down the freeway, and he knows about that. He, it's his, if he's in control of that little detail, what is it that he can do in your life and mine? Is he capable of taking care of us? Is he able to get you through whatever conflict you may be finding yourself in the middle of, or the situation where your health or whatever is at stake? He's able and in control of all of those things. And so we should be people who love life, who refrain our tongues from evil, who turn away from evil and do good and seek peace. That's our responsibility because God sees and knows everything that is going on in our lives. He especially takes note when we are suffering for righteousness sake. And we may do that yet. So, but look at the difference in terms of what's going on with the righteous and those who do evil. Remember the first part of Psalm 30, number one that I quoted? But the face of the Lord, he says, is against those who do evil. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the ways of the ungodly shall perish. So we see the contrast that is there. I, I think of Psalm 73, uh, verses, uh, it's about verse 16, I think, where the psalmist is, is going through all this stuff and he's looking at the ungodly and how they prosper and everything is going their way. And boy, he just says, I just, when I thought about this, it was just too much for me. And then he says, until, I love that word, until I went into the sanctuary. Then I understood. The sanctuary, what is that represented above? The presence of God. When I, when I thought about it, looked at all the stuff that's going around me, boy, it was just overwhelming. But then I went into the presence of God. Then I understood. Praise the Lord for that understanding. Amen? The psalmist sought to understand, but when he went into the sanctuary, then he understood. So, Having looked at these virtues, this, the, these commandments that we are to respond to, I, I see there is a, an important lesson for us. As believers, we can and must grow spiritually and be mature to a point where we walk consistently before the Lord in light of God's Word. Notice I didn't say perfectly, consistently. A consistent life of the things that we talked about of compatibility, of compassion, of caring, of uh, comforting and being courageous, and now of forgiving, of purity. And it doesn't mean that we will never fail, but it does mean that we will be consistent. It means that we, when we do fail, we acknowledge it and allow God's grace to restore and strengthen us. And while these virtues of spiritual maturity are general enough to... Uh, encompass all of our lives in every way, they are also specific enough to hit us, specific enough to hit us where it may hurt sometimes. Again, folks, it, it, it's about exposing ourselves to the Word of God. And none of us can claim ignorance when it comes to that, can we? Well, I didn't know that. Well, did you read the Bible? Have you spent time allowing the Spirit of See, we can't just be ignorant. We can't just live life in some kind of a vacuum going merrily on our way where we can ignore what the Word of God tells us to do and how to live. But when we do expose ourselves, when we do listen, it isn't for hurting us, although it may hurt. It's for healing us so that Christ is, example, is an example in our lives. We're meant to, uh, it's meant to cause us to be not to become uh, you know, morbidly introspective, but to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our, to our lives. And, and, and that happens when we get a bigger picture, when we see things in a different light. 
What he does have in mind is a greater purpose of holiness in our lives for us to be, to have hope and to have uh, uh, godliness about our lives. So uh, the question comes that I, I ask myself in this is, how am I doing? I've looked at my, I'm, I'm trying to keep my own life in perspective. Have I grown? I've, I can say I've been in the way for 60 plus years. Have I been in the way? More than I have conform and I, I'm taking a look and sometimes I just think man I I need to work on this I haven't matured in that way at all are we willing to hold the mirror of the word of God up to our lives and allow him to speak to us so that we can see those things it's just crucial for us I can't just blow it off or, or in, in some kind of feigned uh, humility and say well I'm not perfect but we can do that easily, can't we? But we really have to bow our hearts before the Lord and God's presence and ask Him to examine me and to see if there is any wicked way in us as David prayed. And if there is, if we find something that's there, what should we do with it? Get rid of it. Take out the trash. Get rid of those things so that our, that our character and our conduct match so that it isn't this great gap between our character who we are in Christ and our conduct which is lacking but they are on a plane that we can see that there is growth that we are maturing in the Lord amen I want to grow in that don't you I mean as, as I look across here most of us are mature physically we're seasoned saints as it were are we mature are we growing? Because there's still growth that can happen even at this point in our lives. There is growth yet to take place in us. God's not through with us yet. Do you say amen to that? I'm thankful for that. Lord, I want to grow. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to live a life that is pleasing to you where the Holy Spirit moves and works in my life and I have the opportunity to share Jesus with the people that I come in contact with so that they see Jesus in me. Amen? Amen. Amen.